sometimes there were these personality conflicts and it would be easier for me as a supervisor to just assign a different examiner or a different specialist and make that issue go away. Hey everyone, this is Mark with a special archive episode of With Flying Colors. I hope you enjoy. Do you want to maximize your success with NCUA? Join Mark Trifle as he shares with you the insider's view on passing your exam with flying colors. The With Flying Colors podcast is sponsored by Credit Union Exam Solutions by Mark Trichel. If you would like to work directly with the Credit Union Exam Solutions team and receive support to optimize your results with NCUA so you save time and money, visit us at marktrichel.com to find out more. Hello, I'm Mark Treichel, and you are listening to With Flying Colors, the podcast where I interview subject matter experts to provide credit union leaders with tips on how you can achieve success with NCUA and pass your exam with flying colors. Today, I'm joined by Todd Miller, who's going to talk about examination appeals up to the regional level. Todd, before we jump in, for folks who are just meeting you for the first time, could you share a little bit about who you are and your career and your experience? Okay, thank you, Mark. I started with NCUA in 1987. I did retire here in June of 2021, so had almost 34 years with NCUA, and during that time, I was an examiner a problem case officer, a regional capital market specialist. Last 10 years, I was the director of special actions in the Western region. I've went through this appeals process on more than a number of occasions and even served on NCUA supervisory review committee. So I had 34 years with NCUA, enjoyed all of it, and I enjoyed the chance to talk to you here today and share some of my experiences with people. Yeah, Todd, it, it's it's great to have you as part of, of my team. I've enjoyed, obviously, I enjoyed working with you at NCUA. We got to work real closely together at one of the corporate conservatorships. And I got to know you on my West Coast time back when I was director of special action. So we can speak to that. But you, you've, you have a lot of background uh, in the field levels, like the capital markets, like you were saying, and and having been on the supervisory review panel that is a very unique perspective for credit unions and also from ex-NCUA or current ex-NCUA. Your resume and the background of this is going to be real helpful. So uh, with that, let's talk about exam appeals at the regional level. But before that, why don't we talk a little bit about what happens between examiners coming in to start the exam and, and then how the final exam report actually gets issued. This plays a big role in appeals over 2019 and 2020 NCUA kind of changed the whole process of how reports get issued to credit unions. It used to be the examiner could issue the report directly to the credit union on their own at the completion of the exam. And that's no longer the case. Um, now, before reports get issued, they always get reviewed by the supervisory examiner. Depending on the credit union and the CAMEL rating, that review might extend all the way up to the division of the supervision in the regional office. And for large credit unions and those troubled credit unions with camel fours and stuff, that report's gonna get reviewed by an associate regional director as well before it's ever issued to the credit union. So credit unions no longer see draft reports. They'll see draft exam findings and doors, but now when they get a report, it's a final report and it's been reviewed and approved at various levels within the agency before they even see it. I was around when we made this transition and NCUA uh, was the only banking regulator that, that didn't have some higher level of review, which is, which is one of the reasons we went in this direction. A lot of state uh, supervisory authorities, state regulators were doing it uh, before we started doing it. And so you're saying you might see a document resolution on capital adequacy or something, but you wouldn't see the supplementary facts, you wouldn't see the exam overview, you wouldn't maybe have discussions about the CAMEL code until it had gone up to that higher level. Am I interpreting that right? 
That is correct. In fact, examiners are told not to discuss camel codes during the exams any longer because those camel codes have to get approved by at the supervisory level or the final re review level, whichever that might be. And overviews, you're not going to see drafts of those. Supplementary facts, the EIC may or may not let you see a draft of that because those are just kind of additional information to, to enhance what they've given you as draft exam findings and draft doors and you need to understand the doors and findings you see they are drafts they might get changed from your exit conference to um, when the final report shows up got it and so you used to see a draft report and now you don't see a draft report how does how does that relate to i'm sure we're going to get into how that relates to the appeal process, how does that relate to, there, there used to be a requirement where there was a certain number of days before a joint conference or an exit interview that you would have to give a draft report. It was seven days under the old rule if you had doors that you needed to let the party review the report before you held that joint conference. And, you know, now it kind of depends, you know, Camel 1s and Camel 2s, they might not even have a joint conference. They might just get that final report and it's all done. If you are going to have a door, you'll get a final report. Hopefully that examiner does give you a few days to dissect that before you have that joint conference. And a lot of times the joint conference dates are set and they try and fit that review process into it. So your exam's over, we'll set our joint conference out here a month. And, you know, typically it just kind of depends on what level that review is. If it's just going to a supervisory examiner, or the division of supervision or ARD, there's different timeframes for getting those reviews completed. But usually everyone will try and get that process completed in time for that joint conference that is tentatively set at the end of the exit in most cases. Got it, got it. All right, so the credit union gets that final report and it contains its CAMEL ratings, its document of, of resolution or door items, examiner findings or EFs, or comments that the credit union might disagree with. So they might disagree with the camel, they might disagree with the door, uh, they might disagree with a sentence in supplementary facts or in the overview. Uh, a lot of times what they disagree with would be things that NCUA expects action on. So that happens, a credit union finds itself at this fork in the road, what do they do? So what would the next steps be relative to an appeal? Well, I'm going to back up and just give some hints to let's try and avoid appeals. To I love it. With. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's some things credit unions can do, and this is the way it works most of the time. I mean, appeals are not all that common. They're fairly rare, but they do happen um, with some frequency. But I think there's a lot of things that a credit union management team can do to avoid us ever having surprises in that final exam report. And that goes to just managing that whole exam process and communicating effectively to make sure you don't get surprises. So, you know, when your exam's in process, make sure you're commuting openly with that exam staff. That includes the EIC and team members. And this becomes a challenge in NCUA's virtual world over the last couple of years. And, you know, those examiners are not sitting there in your building the EIC and that exam team, they're all in different locations. So, you know, there's challenges for them to get on the same page. Sometimes they're not always on the same page. When you have a larger credit union and a larger exam team, make sure you have frequent check-ins during that exam with both. If you're a CEO, make sure you're talking to your staff. What are the examiners saying to you? And then check in with that exam staff, you know, several times during the exam. It's probably a good idea just to have briefings like every week on a two or three week exam or even a couple times a week. When the examiners do give you draft items during that exam, take the time to understand any risk ratings they provide you during the exam. The credit examiners use those risk ratings to set that camel code. You should see proposed doors or exam findings during the exam especially with document or resolutions, those corrective actions are negotiable. And do sit down, negotiate with them, make sure it's a legitimate problem and make sure you understand the findings. It's much easier to get all this stuff resolved during the exam rather than get surprised with the final exam report. So the first step is 
in the appeal process is try and make sure we don't get, have to use the appeal process. Let's try and get everything squared away during the exam to the greatest extent possible. And like I said, you have to be very intentional about that, especially now in the COVID world where you're not all in the same room and you have to use these virtual forms of communications and you lose that face-to-face -face contact. All great points, Todd. And I'll hit the, the, the nail with the hammer on the try and resolve it during the exam. That front level contact between the district examiner and any specialists that might be there, if you can resolve it with good communication, is communication is the key, key to life in everything, whether you're, whether you're dealing uh, with negotiating with somebody on a contract, whether you're dealing with being a, a parent to your children, if there's good communication on both sides, things go better. And that starts first and foremost with the examination. Now, if you, I, I will say as an aside, and maybe we can talk about this a little later, you know, since, since I left NCUA and, and am, am now consulting and have had some clients that, that have been at that fork in the road. And I think, you know, we're going to talk about what your options are if you feel you do want to appeal. I used to get approached by credit unions, like at the governmental affairs conference, where there might have been a complaint and they would want to talk through what their steps would be. And I would explain that. But oftentimes the trade associations or the leagues would come to come to the NCUA board or they would come to me as a regional director and they'd say, hey, we have someone who says there's an examiner in this part of the country that's being a little heavy handed. And they're afraid uh, for retaliation relative to that. And the, the policy at NCUA is there is no retaliation. The policy is that if somebody appeals it, they have all these rights that they can pursue. But the reality is without specifics, it's hard for NCUA to deal with it. And so that would be typically the response. Well, if you don't give me specifics, there's nothing that I can really do with it. Now that I'm on the other side, assisting credit unions, I, I, I realize the weight of that, what that means to the credit unions more than I ever did in my you know, 34 years at NCUA. And I've had a couple of clients, I actually use the phrase, go along to get along. And they hit, you know, so you hit this fork in the road. The examination says we need to do X. I don't really think we do because that's going to create a cost of Y. And is the risk that they're saying is to a certain level really at that level? But do I go along to get along? Is this the issue that I do want to appeal? Or do I try and improve those communications at the field level and have a discussion with the examiner to try and explain my side, which is, you know, again, like you said, do it during the exam. It's just that the magnitude, it, I never realized that almost every discussion that NCUA has with the credit union, they have to weigh in that manner. Is this something that I agree with? Is this something that I disagree with 10%? Or is this something I just dis disagree with 80% that I really want to push back? And that takes a lot of time and energy in the credit unions. And quite frankly, until I was helping credit unions understand the exam process and helping them through their examinations, uh, I didn't fully realize the magnitude of that. You have any thoughts or comments on that statement? I do. I have a couple. First, like when you get an exam report and I'll do this myself, someone will send me an email or I'll get an appraisal and there's something in it I don't like. I think the first thing you do is you just kind of set that down and, and digest it for at night and then kind of reread it the next day. When I was a supervisor, I would always have my staff give doors to me. And one of the things I would look at is this going to cost credit more money than it's worth. And I think credit unions have to weigh that cost benefit of appealing things. Appeals take a lot of time and time costs a lot of money. And is it worth appealing or is it just easier to spend a little bit of money and, and do what the examiner says? Sometimes it's worth it to address something in an inexpensive way rather than appeal it. I do think it's always worth a conversation with the examiner, even if you're not going to file a formal appeal and kind of let them know your thought process and, and make sure you understand what they wrote. But yes, I mean, sometimes you may think that examiner's wrong and they may have an exam finding, which is correctable in the normal course of business. You don't think you need to do anything. Sometimes if it's just a small policy or procedural change, it's easier just to write that into a policy or procedure rather than appeal that examiner's determination. 
at the end of the day, the examiners are trying to help you. It, it, it's not malicious on their part or anything. But yeah, sometimes it's better to not appeal if it's not going to cost you a lot to address the issue or, you know, if you don't agree necessarily with a camel rating, but that doesn't affect your employee performance goals or it doesn't affect your credit rating with the FHLB or any external parties, sometimes it might not be worth appealing that item in a formal process all the way up to the regional director. Uh, I do uh, think it's worth it. No, go ahead. I'm I, do sorry. Th- I do think it's worth a conversation with the examiner or the SE though, and you may just stop at that point. Got it. Yeah. So indeed, we both agree that sometimes it, it makes sense to go along to get along. And, and you said they're there with good intent. The credit union is there with good intent. So try and resolve it is always step one. So there are going to be some situation where the credit union does do its best to manage the examination process. Yet the And they've negotiated. They've used all their meet and deal skills with the examiner. And the report still contains a surprise or something that they materially disagree with, what would they do next? Well, when a credit union gets this exam, that first two pages, there's a whole six point bullet section that says levels of appeal. Well, first thing is read through that and understand those levels of appeal. There's timeframes in there for formal appeals to the regional director. Make sure you adhere to those timeframes. The appeal process, it always starts with the examiner, then the supervisory examiner, then the regional director. I think depending on the item, you know, sometimes you might want to actually bring in the supervisory examiner right away. Um, Do consider how much documentation you need. If you're going to choose to appeal, it's going to take some documentation because you're going to have to prove your point that the examiner made a mistake, they missed something. And let's just be honest, the examiners do make mistakes and, you know, they send you an exam request list and you give them 10,000 pages or 2,000 pages of documents. Sometimes the piece of it isn't read by a team member and it just gets overlooked and it results in a finding or door that is not necessary. But you're going to have to gather up all that information to prove your point. And you do need to consider that with the appeals is how much documentation do you need to prevail? And you're going to have to prove your point. And it can be done, though. Nowadays, it's hard with this whole report approval process for an examiner or supervisor to get in a report changed. So sometimes you're often going to end up at that supervisor RD levels, which is a more formal appeal in writing. And like I said, you do have to make sure you file those within 30 days and provide enough documentation to demonstrate that report was an error or the examiner's conclusions were incorrect, sometimes you're going to have to provide more information than you even gave the examiner during the exam. But you have to prove somewhere that the examiners made an error and and their conclusions are an error, in fact. That said, it can be done. Um, I spent a lot of time as a supervisor. I had a few exams appealed. And, of course, I talked to a lot of other supervisors It's not uncommon when a credit union appeals at the regional director level that they will prevail in part with changes to CAMEL ratings or they'll see corrective action softened or removed from the report. So don't be scared to do it. You know, I was with NCUA for 31 years and I'm going to be honest, I didn't really see any instances where examiners retaliated against credit unions because of an exam appeal. I'm not going to deny sometimes there's just personality conflicts. One examiner and one specific person in a credit union just don't get along, and that leads to issues. But I wouldn't be scared to appeal. If this is the material thing that's going to cost you money and the examiners have it wrong, don't be scared to appeal. Credit unions have pretty good success at the regional director level of proving their case. And it's just because honest mistakes throughout the exam process were all human and Examiners sometimes make mistakes and miss things. All, all great points. So yeah, you talked about supervisory examiner right away. I, I, I'm assuming, so once it's finalized, you end up getting where the examiner has less control about doing something. But let's say it was, we think you need to add these 10 things tied to your investment policy. You disagree with the examiner. 
and then the examiner doesn't change or they change a little bit, but you're still unhappy, you're saying get that supervisory examiner involved before it goes on up to the higher level. So let's deal with that one first. Yes, always start with the supervisory examiner. For the smaller cardians, a lot of times they can alter a report just on their own. If you go above the supervisory examiner, well, the region's process is they're going to go back to the supervisory examiner and start there anyway. So it's always best to start with that supervisory examiner. You know, while they may have read the report and okayed it, a lot of times they're minimally involved in the exam. So they might not know all the background to the exam and everything. So it's always a good place to start with that supervisory examiner. The appeal levels, that's kind of the way it lays it out. That's the agency's expectation is you will start with that supervisory examiner. And it's always the best place to start. And just in a general view, we always talk about credit unions having relationships with their examiners. Well, it's good for them to have working relationships with those supervisory examiners as well. Absolutely. Uh, excellent, excellent point. So I'm curious, I, I'm interested to hear your thought on this next question, which is similar, but slightly different. And so you were a capital market specialist. You were also a supervisor. The an exam happens, you've got the principal examiner who's in charge of issuing the report, you've got a capital markets specialist, and you've got a commercial loan specialist that come in. The exam goes on, the team's there, and well, this is, I'm almost saying this in a, in a forum where, where NCUA used to be on site, but let's say it's virtual or, you know, whichever. And you're interacting with the capital market specialist. They do their work. They come up with something that's a proposed document resolution. They give it to the principal examiner. And the capital market specialist has a lot of other responsibilities out of the other exams, and they go on their way to their next assignment. And I've, I have given the advice to some of my clients that you, you want to have a really good communication with those specialists that are there, and you want to be able to talk to them while they're there, while they're assigned to you. Because what I've seen happen in some instances is that higher ranking, higher graded, higher paid specialist does work, gives it to the principal examiner who's responsible. And then the principal examiner has to carry the water, if you will, of the other experts. And then you start asking questions about that yet it's not the expertise that they particularly have. While they might have capital markets background, they relied on this other specialist. So any, you agree, you agree with my, my, my precept that talk to the people while they're there because if the specialists move on, it can get a little bit harder to negotiate? Yes, I do agree with that. And if you get involved with an appeal and it involves like a regional lending specialist that was on the exam or a capital market specialist, I don't think it's out of bounds to, as you're talking to the supervisory examiner, say, hey, can we get the specialists on the phone too? Um, sometimes what happens, this happens infrequently, but it, it, it does happen where a specialist, whether it's a information systems officer or security officer or a capital market specialist or a regional lending specialist, they'll do an extensive write-up and they will write findings that are detailed and through the editing process, the EIC edits them, you know, thinking that they're making it easier to read, but it tends to sometimes change the context of what they wrote. So you do see issues like that come up occasionally where as reports get edited, what the specialists meant is not what ends up in that report. So sometimes that does occur. Uh, but when you have complex questions about something a specialist did, I think it's fine to ask the EIC supervisory examiner, hey, can we get this specialist on the phone after the exam and talk through this? Certainly talk to them extensively during the exam, but if there's something you're unclear about when you get that final report, don't be scared to ask them to get on a phone call and say, explain this to me. Great advice, great advice. The third item that you referenced that I want to uh, highlight a little bit is the fact that sometimes there just are personality conflicts, right? Everybody doesn't get along with everybody. And I, I have my thoughts on, on kind of what I had seen as during my arc of my career relative to that. But there are times when someone's appeal might include 
you know, I, I think our camel rating was wrong. I think this document resolution was unfair. Here's the 100 pages that support why I think that document resolution. And oh, by the way, this personality conflict is such that we would like a different examiner. What had you seen that? It's come up a few times in my career. <laughs> so yeah, give me your thoughts on that. I'm going to give you my own personal opinion and the way I dealt with that as a supervisor. This might not specifically be official agency policy, but it's the way I would choose to deal with it. And I don't think it's dissimilar to what other supervisors may do as well. First, we're going to look at the factual situations regarding the report. If you're a CAMEL 1 crediting with no troubles, you're going to, as a supervisor, look at that differently than if this is a CAMEL 4 credit union close to failing. But I'll look at that whole background situation. And, and you know, I was typically involved in joint conferences and exit meetings. So I had a feel, and I will just say that, hey, sometimes as a supervisor, I'm just going to say, hey, the crediting was wrong. This was, they're, they're, they're raising a complaint about an examiner because they don't want to deal with their issue. And then I might not have changed that person. But those get very, very case specific. I think it does happen. I would look at them as impartially as I could, knowing that, hey, occasionally there are personality conflicts. And to the extent resources are available, you reassign someone. But I also would look at it on a rare occasion that maybe you're complaining about the examiner, but you're going to get the same outcome with another one. And I'm not going to reassign that person because they already have extensive knowledge about your organization and what's occurring. And that more ha happened more often in troubled credit unions, um, a typically well-run credit union. There was personality conflicts. I would quite often just assign someone else and make that issue go away. That's how I dealt with it personally. I don't know necessarily know that that's agency policy, but I think a lot of other supervisors would look at it in the same framework. Let's go look at this fact pattern here. And if it truly is just a conflict in personalities, well, NCBA has got lots of employees. They can assign someone else. Great, great answer. I agree with 100% of what you said. There were times when I was a regional director where those requests were made that I would actually have to make a decision on it. And there were other times, like you said, where it was mitigated uh, along the way where it never even got to me as a regional director, but the, the, the supervisory examiner or the director of special action said, let's just change this up. Let's get a, a different set of eyes. It's NCUA rotates examiners after a certain amount of time. There is a good there's value in having them there more than one year, but there's also the complacency and the challenges that you can get if they stay there too long. And then when you weave in the potential of the personality challenges, they're not common, but they, when you're doing, when you have 5,000 credit unions and you're doing exams in two thirds of them every year, they're going to happen. So great advice, Todd. Now, so we've talked about appeals up to the regional director level. There'll be future podcasts where we'll talk about what can happen beyond that. You've been involved in that. I've got another person uh, joining my team that's going to talk on a future podcast relative to that whole topic. So, Todd. Those uh, appeals they, get a lot more costly, too. Yeah, a lot more costly. Yes, indeed. So any last thoughts from you before I wrap? No, I don't think so. I, I, I am going to reiterate, you know, the best way to deal with an appeal is to avoid it during the exam process. Communication, you mentioned it earlier, is kind of at the heart of this. If you're communicating openly, honestly with your examiners during that exam process, we shouldn't have surprises and things shouldn't go to the appeal process at all. Um, unfortunately, we're all human. Mistakes get made and appeals do occur. But if you feel strongly about it, that the examiner is, is wrong, don't be scared to appeal. If it's a material issue, it's fine. Very good. Yeah, great. Todd, this was great. I want to thank you for being my guest today. In closing, now, something Todd said or some, something I said may have triggered a question or a specific example that as you're listening to this relative to your credit union, you might have a follow-up question. If you have a follow-up question, send it to me and I'll, I'll tell you how you can get that to me. But one of the features I want to do with this podcast is allow for follow-up questions that can be dealt with in future editions of a podcast. Also, 
If you'd like to talk to me about how Todd and I could assist you in your credit union, you can reach me at my email, which is cuexamsolutions at marktreichel.com or via my website, which is www.marktreichel.com. Okay, folks, that's it for today. I'm Mark Treichel, and I hope you join me again next time for With Flying Colors. Thank you for joining us on this episode of With Flying Colors. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear future episodes where subject matter experts of all varieties will provide tips on how to achieve success with NCUA. If you would like to learn more about how we assist credit unions, check out our services at marktrichel.com. 